Good morning. Welcome to yet another new episode of Daybreak. Psalm 33 verse 21 says, For our hearts rejoice in the Lord because we trust in His holy name. So let's rejoice in Him by glorifying His holy name through this song. Wasn't that a beautiful and a blissful experience? Certain anecdotes have a ring of truth to it. So let's listen to this anecdote and understand what we can take from it. Well, are you ready to hear something about confession? Um, there are many, many there are many, many stories about confession, and I've sev heard several of them. One of my favorites is about two Irishmen who were walking down Fifth Avenue in, in New York City. And it was late at night. They had been out drinking, and it was about midnight. And, and 
One of them went up and tried the door to St. Patrick's Cathedral in downtown New York, and believe it or not, the door to the cathedral was open. So he says, Mike, this is Pat, he says, Mike, I think I'll go in and, and, and go to confession. So um, Mike goes in, and he goes into the confessional, he kneels down, and, and uh, Pat says to himself, well, I think I'll go too. So he goes, and he goes in, and he goes on the other side. So here are the two of them on either side with no priest at all in the confessional. So Mike starts telling his confession. He goes on and on about his whole life and all the things he's done in his life. And when he gets through, when he gets through, he stops, and he looks around, and he sees there's no priest. And he says, he says, uh, he says uh, Mike, are you there? And he says, yes, I am. He says, there's no priest here. Where do you think he went? And he says, well, Pat, he says, if he heard what I just heard, if he heard what I just heard, he went to call a cop. <laughs> so anyway, so you hear interesting things in confession. And one of the more interesting, one of the more interesting stories I ever heard was about, was about a Catholic a catechist who was teaching religion on a mission uh, in Africa, and deep down in, in, the, in the jungles of Africa. And he was Catholic, and there, was, there were Baptists in the, areas as, uh, the area as well, and there was a young uh, a Baptist deacon. So there was, a, on the one hand, there was a Catholic catechist, a native, and on the other hand, a native uh, Baptist deacon. They got to be quite good friends, and they used to talk about the differences in their religion. <clears throat> and so one day the deacon says to the catechist, do you mean to tell me that you tell your, you tell your sins, you tell all your sins to a priest? And the catechist said, yes, that's part of our re religion. We're the only religion that's able to, uh, the only religion that's able to forgive sins. So we tell our sins to the priest. And Jesus told uh, Peter and the apostles, the sins you forgive are forgiven, the ones that you retain, that you hold back, are held back. Now, how would those apostles know which ones were to be forgiven, which ones were to be retained, unless they heard them, unless they heard them with their own ears, you know? Well, then the, the deacon said to the catechist, well, you tell your sins to the priest. Who does the priest tell them to? And he said, he thought for a moment, the catechist wasn't very well educated. He didn't know that, that anybody, including the pope, can tell their sins to another priest. So he said, oh, I guess there's a bishop here. I guess the priest must tell their sins, must tell their sins uh, to, the, to the bishop. And the, and the uh, Baptist deacon said, well, then who does the bishop, who does the bishop go to? And he said, well, I, I don't know, but they go to Rome a lot and there are cardinals there. I, I bet that they, the bishops go to the cardinals. And the cardinals, who do they go to? He said, well, they're over in Rome. I guess they have to go to the pope to confession. And then he said, finally, and who does the pope go to? And uh, the uh, uninformed catechist said, well, I guess the pope must get down on his knees and confess his sins to God directly. And so the deacon, the Baptist deacon said, aha, now I have it. Your pope is a Baptist and he doesn't even know it because he's confessing his sins directly, directly to God. Well, we don't as Catholics confess our sins directly to God. We don't confess our sins directly to God we confess them to any priest in the world, and there are now how many? In our country alone, there's 40 or 50,000. In whatever country you're in, there are so many priests, and they're available. There are times when you can go and get rid of all the sins, all the sins of your entire life. Uh, I recommend to you very sincerely that, that if you haven't been in a while, like a lot of Catholics have not been, that you take it upon yourself, on my recommendation, to go to a priest that'll be the kindest, person you've met in a long time. Amen and amen. I am sure the message would have enlightened you. Saints were normal people like us, but the only difference between them and us is that they put their complete trust in the Lord and because of which they sustained. So let's listen to one such life story of a saint of today. John Chrysostom has a special place in the church, not just as Bishop of Constantinople, but chiefly as a doctor of the church. 
John Chrysostom was born in a noble family to Secundus and Anthusa in the year 344 AD. Secundus was an officer of high rank in the Syrian army. He died soon after Chrysostom's birth and hence he was brought up by his mother. She not only instructed her son in piety but also sent him to the best schools of Antioch. He studied under Libanius, a pagan, the most famous orator of the age. Those days he met the bishop Melatius and influenced by him, John began to withdraw from classical and profane studies and started to devote himself to an ascetic and religious life. He studied holy scripture and frequented the sermons of Melatius. About three years later, he was baptized and was ordained lector. But desiring to lead a more perfect life, left behind the relative wealth of his family and lived a strict lifestyle as a monastic hermit, devoting himself entirely to prayer, fasting and study of the Holy Scripture. Four years later, Chrysostom resolved to live in one of the caves near Antioch. He remained there two years. This regimen permanently damaged his health. However, he returned to Antioch to regain his health and resumed his office as lector in the church, eventually becoming a deacon. As deacon, he had to assist at the liturgical functions to look after the sick and poor and also to some degree assist with teaching catechumens. At the same time, he continued his literary work and composed his most famous book on the priesthood. In the year 386, Chrysostom was ordained priest by Bishop Flavian. In the next 12 years, he grew in the church as a well-versed preacher. John gained popularity because of his eloquence in preaching and public speaking at the Golden Church Cathedral in Antioch. He was renowned for his insightful expositions of Bible passages and moral teaching. The themes of his talks were practical, explaining the Bible's application to everyday life. The success of his preaching was chiefly due to extraordinary faculty of speech, the way of presenting and illustrating them, and the conviction with which he delivered the message. He was best known for his extensive and profound teachings on the subject of the Holy Eucharist. Many of his sermons call for concrete steps to share wealth with the poor. He empathized with the spiritual and temporal needs of the poor. He also spoke against abuse of wealth and personal property. Many pagans converted to Christianity as a result of his homilies. When it came to justice and charity, John acknowledged no double standards. Aloof, energetic, outspoken, especially when he became excited in the pulpit, John was a sure target for criticism and personal trouble. Nectarius, the Bishop of Constantinople, died in 397 and John Chrysostom was ordained as the Bishop of Constantinople on the 26th of February. 398. In the presence of a great assembly of bishops, his new position was not an easy one. During his time as Archbishop, Chrysostom introduced drastic changes. As the first step, he ordered the reduction of expenses of the Episcopal household. He adamantly refused to host lavish social gatherings. He put an end to the frequent banquets. He told visiting regional preachers to return to the churches they were meant to be serving without any payout. Some had preferred to roam about aimlessly and without discipline. Chrysostom confined them to their monasteries. Finally, he took care of the ecclesiastical widows. On the other hand, the people showed themselves delighted with the sermons of their new bishop and frequently applauded him in the church. They never forgot his care for the poor and miserable and that in his first year, he had built a great hospital with the money he had saved in his household. He also founded a series of hospitals in Constantinople to care for the poor. He was a man of strong principles and great courage. Through his attempts to change the morals of the church, the city and of the court, he made many enemies, including the Empress Eudoxia. His enemies devised charges against him and he was condemned without opportunity to respond at the Synod of the Oak. He was exiled at first to Kurusis in Armenia and then as he continued in his forthright preaching he was sent into deeper exile. En route to Pontus he died from exhaustion on September 14th 407 
as a result of being forced to travel in appalling weather conditions his last words were said to be glory be to god for all things he was buried in komana on the 27th of january 438 his body was transferred to constantinople with great pomp and entombed in the church of the apostles st john chrysostom is a saint whose life and teachings could inspire us all to lead a life worthy of our calling a life of faith that is rooted in prayer and grounded in actions a life that is pleasing in god's sight as you heard this saint didn't just listen to the word of god but did what it said as james 122 says do not deceive yourselves by just listening to the word of god but do what it asks you to do so let us also listen to the word of god and obey it as we listen to this promise of the day let us contemplate and meditate on it praise the lord dear friends welcome to the daily bread a daily reflection on the word of god today we are going to reflect on a miracle performed by jesus in healing a blind man reported the gospel according to mark chapter 8 verses 22 to 26 they came to bethsaida some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village and when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid the hands on him he asked him can you see anything and the man looked up and said i can see people but they look like trees walking then jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he looked intently and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly then he sent him away to his home saying do not even go into the village this is the word of the lord praise the lord dear friends in the gospel of mark we come to the conclusion or the climax of the galilean ministry of jesus that ends with the confession of peter again and again the evangelist was reporting about the blindness the hardness of heart and the lack of understanding of the disciples but at the same time he was also showing how the disciples were seeing participating witnessing in the miracles the one just before this was the healing of a deaf dumb man gradually he comes to hear and to speak now the feeding of the the 4000 and finally now come to the healing of a blind man this comes after the deporting about the hardness of heart do you not yet understand that was the last word before the healing of this blind man so this healing is presented as a sign specifically intent for the disciples and mark is showing how gradually the disciples are coming to the discernment about the person of jesus that will be reported in the next episode so this is a blind man in bethsaida and he is brought again by his companions the the intercession of the people for the blind man and surprisingly jesus takes him out of the village we don't know why because he doesn't want to see publicity and he is only showing the blind man giving him the sight to see so he takes him out and two things he does lay his hand on the head and touches his eyes with saliva the touching healing touch is not a medical is not so much a medicinal practice but the healing touch the closeness of god to this person and the healing is taking place at two stages and that also should be asked why why did not jesus allow him to see clearly the first time so here we are given a sign not so much for the sight of this blind man but what is going to happen in the next episode 
So this blind man comes gradually to perceive the reality. First he sees something, but is so, so deformed, distorted, that he sees human persons walking like trees, something quite big, not clear. He comes to say, see something, but vague. And then the second time he sees everything clearly. So this is the gradual process of understanding of the disciples about Jesus Christ. They had been walking with Jesus maybe for a year and a half now or more. They had been with him. They heard him speak. They saw him work miracles. They participated in his power. And still they were blind and they could not see. But gradually they come to the understanding who this person is. And that is what is revealed in the blind man's recovering sight or receiving sight. So gradually he is brought to clarity. And this is, can happen for us also. Maybe it takes time to understand what God is telling us, who Jesus is. We don't understand him right at the beginning, maybe. For some it takes time, for some it's a kind of revelation like Paul had. For others it will take time, time to see clearly. But one thing is clear, God wants us. God wants us to see him as he is. God wants us revealed to us his love and his compassion in Jesus Christ. And the disciples would understand him so that they can become witnesses, they can become the channels of revelation to others. If they don't understand, if we don't understand, how can we proclaim, how can we be a witness to others? So gradual development. Don't get frustrated if your faith is not strong. Don't get frustrated if you don't understand everything. Keep on trying, keep on praying, and God will reveal. The revelation will come. It's a gradual growth in the relationship with God, uh, experiencing his love. And surely he will lead us to the full sight as he led the blind man. Let's conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us sight, for seeing yourself, your face in the face of Jesus, and your face in the face of our brothers and sisters. Thank you for giving us hearing to listen to you in the needs and the prayers and also pleas of our brothers and sisters. Enable us never to forget, never to get hardened in our hearts. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we've heard the word of God, let's meditate upon it and let's glorify the Lord with this song. Be strong and take courage, do not fear or be dismayed. For the Lord will go before you, and His light will shine the way. Be strong and take courage, do not fear or be dismayed. For the one who lives within me, will be my strength today. to place my hope in you. Teach me to wait on you, O Lord. Lord, make me strong to proclaim
strong and take courage Do not fear or be dismayed For the Lord will go before you And His light will shine the way Be strong and take courage Do not fear or be dismayed within me will be my strength today I want to place my hope in you teach me to wait on you an amazing and a spirit-filled day.